start that I want to welcome everyone for coming to uh, actually the last one of the of this session of Eurostruct uh, talks. Um, this is a round of uh, webinars which are offered virtually, um, which are also supported by, uh, of course, the Eurostruct Association, the University of Minho. Um, the uh, FIB uh, Association uh, and also Boutique, the studio that has uh, been uh, graciously offering our illustrations for the flyers. Um, I would like to give some information about this talk. It will be recorded and made available on the channel. You watch this through the web page on the dedicated uh, page for, this, um, for these talks. Uh, we ask the participants to keep the cameras turned off and microphone muted. Uh, but for the Q and, and for the Q and A, you could direct uh, your questions to the Eurostruct Association participant in the chat. These will be transferred to us for um, uh, posing later on to the speaker. So today, I'm very pleased to have uh, as a guest Professor James Brownjohn from the University uh, of Exeter. Uh, who will be discussing serviceable and sustainable buildings. Uh, and to introduce uh, our speaker, I will give the floor to my co-host, uh, Professor Jean Casas from uh, the Polytechnic University of Catalonia. Uh, Jean, the floor is yours. Hello, hello everybody. Thank you, Eleni. It's my pleasure to introduce you our speaker for today, Dr. James Brojon. He's a professor of structural dynamics in the vibration engineering section at the University of Exeter and director of the Full Scale Dynamics Limited and director of F FSD Active Limited. He has 35 years of expertise in structural monitoring and field testing of civil structures, including buildings in the UK and Far East. His professional and research interests have closely aligned with experimental investigations on suspension bridges, tall buildings, extreme low vibration facilities, telecom towers, and Victorian era lighthouses. A major interest has been motion and force capture for humans interacting with civil structures in dynamic behavior. As principal investigator for the new B simulators, Exeter Motion, and virtual reality simulator, he can bring all this expertise to bear on improving sustainability and serviceability of structures for human use. So, uh, Professor Rojan, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, <clears throat> thank you very much. So, uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk about this. So, this this is um, a brand new presentation, and it's sort of forced me to put together a number of strands which are in uh, the research and the commercial activity that, that we're, we're doing here in Exeter. So, um, you've been looking at this, the uh, the screen, the front slide already, which gives you an idea of the um, the contents. So I'm going to talk about some of the background, this sort of new topic of um, sustainability, lean design, and uh, new construction, um, where that's heading, and how um, vibration serviceability um, tends to govern design a lot, actually, in, in terms of two areas, and in particular, tall building sway and, and structural floor vibration. Um, and what we're doing about that, um, a couple of things we're looking at, uh, one of them being fixing the path, which is the, the structure components of the, the sequence, and also fixing um, the end user, the receiver, um, using this, this brand new facility, which we've built um, in Exeter, um, which is actually a, um, a dual facility. There's a part of it in Bath. Um, okay, so um, this is just to start off. Um, this is probably a lot of stuff you know already, but um, Buildings and construction have contributed about 39% of global energy and process related emissions. Uh, so far, most of that's been sort of building operational, operational energy, and a smaller part's been related to the materials and construction. And this is what you would call embodied energy. So I'm using EE to represent embodied um, energy, embodied carbon, etc. So this can contribute 9 to 80% residential buildings, total life cycle emissions. And as we're getting better at building uh, structures or nearly zero energy buildings, that, and that proportion actually increases uh, drastically. Whereas renewables can directly reduce operational energy, there's less sort of room to maneuver in the, the materials part of it. Um, so you can see that we're heading towards large amount of greenhouse gases due to embodied energy construction. So we need to deal with this effectively, there's a lot of pressure. 
And just to point out, we, we, you mentioned the construction by floor area. So this is where we're heading. Um, so it's a huge amount of construction, massive, 230 billion square meters. And, and basically that works out as putting Paris on the planet every single week, stunning to think of. A lot of it's engineered workspaces. I'm talking primarily about Europe and North America, although other parts of the world have issues they tend not to be so, um, I would say, sophisticated in design, needing the treatment that we're experiencing in Europe and North America. Um, so the components of that, there's non-residential, which is sort of commercial, um, entertainment, hospital, and there's residential. So we're primarily concerned with the non-residential part. A lot of it's office buildings we're, we're talking about. And you've probably seen all this thrown at you. Uh, we certainly have. Build back better is a well-known phrase of our dear leader, uh, Boris Johnson. Um, and it's not just down to him. OECD is talking about it. Everywhere else is talking about it. It's in the G7 summit. You're getting to hear about it. And by all accounts, the leaders were committed to deal with this big time. Um, and I think this has come out of the, the session in, in Cornwall recently. And you know that everyone's heading to net zero emission targets. So this is where the industry has to head. They're definitely heading this direction. And how are they going to do that? How are they going to manage that? Well, let's see. So in terms of looking at how you can reduce that embodied energy in building construction. So concrete is a huge amount. Um, there's concrete and steel and there's timber, CLT and other composites. So cement itself generates 8% of total CO2, apparently. Steel, depending on how you make it and where you look, it's four to eight percent of total CO2. And as I've said, the pressure is switching from the operational to the embodied side. So we really want to um, reduce the amount of embodied energy in the materials going into construction. So what is actually limiting how we reduce the amount of embodied energy, um, how well we design our structures to make them lean? Um, and one part of that we're looking at big time is how design of floors propagates to design of structural systems in the foundation. So, I mean, it, it seems fairly mundane to talk about floors. Well, floors is what you're standing on or sitting on. Um, it's not a terribly exciting thing to research, you might think, but it turns out that basically that's, you know, what you have to have in the first place to support everything you do. And that is supported by the building structural system, which goes right down to the foundation. And your floor design has a very, very strong influence on how you design the rest of your building. And there's a huge amount of over-design in civil engineering. Um, as you know, if we built airplanes the way we design buildings, they would never fly. So we have to get more rational in dealing with um, structural design and considering all the constraints on it. So when you're considering design and over-design, uh, we're looking at designing for static floor loading. Um, we're not talking about seismic, we're not talking about extreme loads. This is talking about conventional operation. So when you're talking about static loading, there's a huge amount of uncertainty and over-design in the uh, occupancy. So this is part of the serviceability limit state as well, uh, deflections as well as ultimate load. And we talk about design for sway vibration. And when you start to look at how you do that, um, it turns out that there's a lot of uncertainty in the structural dynamic parameters, um, the human factors, as well as the building envelope. So these are all factors which play on consultants when they're designing tall buildings. And tall buildings, I'm talking about, depending if you're building with wood or steel and concrete, um, you know, for steel and concrete, it's probably upwards of about 30 stores or so. Um, and floor design is pervasive, obviously, and there's a huge uncertainty in the, the floor loading and the floor dynamics, big time, and also the human factors. And we're still using sort of decades old design guidance to look at this. And we're starting to use new materials, big time, so cross laminated timber, for example. So we're finding that the consultants are not really that much experience in using this. In terms of dynamics, they're learning how it behaves in the real world and coming up against all sorts of issues, you know, misunderstandings about the way it operates, the boundary conditions, etc. Um, and obviously the clients are always sensitive to cost. So the big question at the end is how much is it going to cost me? How much can I save? 
Well, it has been until now, but now increasingly you might be hearing um, that clients are talking about actually reducing embodied energy. So they're designed for green, probably more so coming up than they're designing for cost. So this is the big driver for design. Um, we're also seeing a lot of modular construction and prefabrication. I'm dealing with hospitals, for example, where a lot of the units are built quickly and shipped on site and put together. And there's a lot of issues about serviceability in these structures in particular. So this is what's happening. Uh, I talked about the concrete, I uh, talked about the steel, and also I talk about the, um, the embodied carbon. So this is one of my colleagues from Walsh um, and in London. Um, they have been focusing so far since 2016 only on the operational energy. So there needs to be a switch much more to the embodied carbon, and this is starting to happen. Okay, so this is the structural engineer. So now you're seeing much more articles coming out about lean design, and the onus is coming to the structural engineer to work out how to, to manage it. So you can look at the distribution of embodied energy in the components according to what type of structure you've got. Floors are taking up the lion's share of the embodied energy, which is quite remarkable, actually. Um, I guess this is not such a high rise building. Um, and then parts going into the beams, the walls, the columns and the foundations. So the foundations themselves take up a pretty big proportion. So what can you do about it as a structural engineer you're designing? Consider the facades. So facades actually surprisingly important, but turns out not as important as human factors. So a building sways, you need to make sure the facades don't fall off. Um, internal partitions can actually help to uh, improve performance. The argument about how long your spans could be. So there's a movement to long spans uh, for open spaces and elegance. But now we're thinking about, well, moving backwards. So constrain the grid a little bit. So do you actually need these large spans? And then the dynamic criteria, are they rational? Are they appropriate? So these are the things that structural engineers start, need to start to think about very, very seriously in terms of serviceability. So it's not ultimate uh, limit state, it's more serviceability limit state that governs design now. And we're hearing this from our uh, consultants. So this is the support for vSIM, um, some of our partners. So these are designers of a lot of the tall buildings in uh, Abu Dhabi and, and Dubai. So they're saying human perception of vibrations increasingly governs design, one span floors, tall buildings. Happold, serviceability and human comfort have become governing. Um, AKT2, one of the big consultants in the UK, vibration serviceability design driver in many of our projects, long span and tall. So this is sway and floor vibration. And this is from a famous guy in Skidmore Owens and Merrill, um, that this acceleration response and habitability in tall building sway is costing millions to deal with. And WSP, embodied energy cost and more importantly, satisfaction of its users. So it's driven by vibration. So very, very much vibration is coming into the picture largely i mean there are other factors as well but it's largely vibration so just to point out the other factors so these are the ones that gun design and material use things to do with safety that you can't avoid so floor loading so this is a building in singapore um five kilonewtons of square meter and this is from the structure engineer a photograph of if you can see that this is a bunch of people not socially distancing i have to say so this was before COVID, uh, uh, generating 3.1 kilonewtons per square meter. Do we really design for that? That's a bit mad, isn't it? When it comes to facades, um, you have to be concerned about the drift, the interstory drift, because the limits are for some of the facade panels and the very tall buildings. And in some cases, they can fall off, and that's a serious safety issue. Uh, this is a building where uh, it wasn't caused by drift, but the facade elements fell off. And because of that, because of the concern of safety, there was about a uh, huge bill to reclad the building effectively because of the facade panels falling off. So these are safety issues as well. Um, so in terms of dynamics, um, this is things that can be avoided. So I'm going to play this a little bit of noise. This is the physics building on the university campus. I went there on May the 20th. It was a Pretty windy building, pretty windy day in Exeter. And you might just about be able to hear it. 
So this was, as I say, the 20th of May. If I fast forward a little bit, you might be able to hear in the background. So this is the wind howling around outside. And the building was moving around a little bit. I could just about feel it going, but it's way below the serviceability limits that people use for design. So, you know, I'm detecting it because I'm hearing it, am I feeling it? Kind of a strange experience, actually, but it wasn't a very strong sway. Question was, is that acceptable? And how do you really tune the trade off between the serviceability and the embodied carbon? And what are the mitigation approaches you can do? And when you're talking about floors, well, we've got vibration. So this is 0.6 meter per second squared. I mean, this is definitely not acceptable. So this is a, a school which we were checking out. So this is um, sort of high frequency floor impulse driven. So what are you going to do about that one? So with vibration serviceability, these problems are always dealt in the same way in terms of the source of power from the receiver. So with the source, we're talking about, in our case for vibration serviceability, humans walking, mainly bouncing and jumping. Um, so the bouncing and jumping is more about entertainment than use, but typically most circumstances is walking. Wind for tall building sway. So humans, the way the loading is generated, they're understood, they're mainly understood pretty well, getting better. Uh, we put a lot of research into that one. In terms of the path, which is the structure, engineers are very good at doing finite element models, of course. They believe them. Some of them are more accurate than others, but there's still some pretty big errors that you can see. And one of the big concerns is about damping estimation. So this is a huge source of uncertainty. And even bigger when you get to the receiver, which is the person who's sitting in the building, what's acceptable uh, for people exposed to vibration? How do you measure that? What are the factors that impinge on that? And this is very, very difficult to, to, to nail down. And the standards and guidance, which we've been using for years, pretty much outdated, to be honest. So first, I'm going to talk about tall buildings, sway, vibration, serviceability, and wind. So as I said, we understand the wind loads pretty well, at least for standard climate systems. If you talk about sort of thunderstorms in certain parts of the world with very special climates, you have a different problem. Um, we understand that, although climate change is going to affect the way uh, that we deal with extreme value statistics and occurrence rates, of course. Um, tall building design process, if you understand, it, is more or less standardized. So you have a wind tunnel test uh, with a high frequency base balance or pressure taps to get the dynamic forces which depend on the shape of the building. Uh, the consultant will do a finite thermal model. Uh, for the mass and the stiffness. Um, the damping value will be thrown in from full scale data from somewhere with some uncertainty. And probably the wind tunnel consultant will put them together and come out with some kind of prediction of what the response will be and whether it matches up and within the limits from certain sources. And when you consider how much body carbon is used to control sway, the question is we don't really know at the moment. So this is a part of research which hasn't really been done. But certainly, uh, according to people I speak to, sway doesn't really govern the frame design below 35 or so stories, unless maybe you're talking about tall timber buildings, which are very susceptible. So if you want to improve lean design, what can you do? Well, my concern is better damping estimation. So I've done a project on Bayesian methods to improve that. And I'm also into very strange methods of force vibration testing, because that can give you much better certainty on damping estimates. And much more important is how to get the acceptance criteria much more user-centric, looking at humans in the loop. So that's the last bit. So for tall building sway, um, here's some examples. So this is Hong Kong. It's not my own video. This is off YouTube, I think. So here you can see, very frightening. Well, maybe it's frightening, but if you live in Hong Kong, you're probably used to it you know what to expect, right? So this is understanding and having managed expectations. This is, I think, Burj Khalifa. Um, it's a rather strange kind of soundtrack. I'm not sure you can hear it. I'm not sure what the yelping is, but you can certainly hear the sort of creaking and groaning of the building frame as the building sways in the wind. And this, I should imagine, is pretty disconcerting. So you've not just got the vibration, you've also got all the other things that go on. 
just to give you an idea what sort of levels we're talking about, um, this is a building in Sheffield. Um, it's called the 40 Tower, not 40 Towers. And it was known to have a reputation for lively Indian wooden sway. We did some monitoring for a while because they reclad it and did some reorganization inside. And this is sort of worst case of vibration we measured. So this is 0 0.05 meter per second squared. And it comes out at around about 0.02 uh, meters per second squared RMS. So sort of hold that thought if you like. And I'm going to test you on this, all right? So, <laughs> but seriously. This just shows you, I wouldn't say the confusion, but the before of information out there to help you to understand and what to design for. So there's various sources out there. So this is the ISO 10137. So this is the 40 tower example I just showed you. So this is for residents. This just about comes and is okay. And it's a couple, it's an order of magnitude or factor of two below office uh, acceptability. So people could feel it, but by that standard, it's probably okay. AIG, AIJ has some thresholds about um, perception. So this is a very common way to do it when you feel it is already too strong. So that. And if you're talking to North American consultants, they will be dealing with sort of 15 to 25 millig of uh, acceleration peak level. So, and you, you need to convert a millig, which is a centimeter squared to 0.01 meter per second squared. So probably heads are spinning already with this, okay? So this is probably the simplest one to go for, the American one. So 25 milli G in 10 years, that's a lot. I think you'd be very, very unhappy with that kind of vibration level when you build. But if it happens only once every 10 years, that's probably okay. And when we assess the performance, are we talking about perception, which is the common way to do it? Do we talk about comfort and acceptability? When we talk about subliminal effects because if you have a sway in a tall building, you may not feel it, but it will affect your mood. It might send you to sleep. This is a so called soapite syndrome. This is an example from a design study. So, this is a building design and it's looked at with different return periods, taking a value of damping or two, 1% damping, 1.5% damping, uh, the consultant's FE model and the high frequency base balance data on the shape and the forces put together and compared with a couple of standards. So this is the RWDI office. It's effectively the American, North American guidance for 15 to 25. This is the ISO for a, a one year return period, the American one for a 10 year return period. And you can see that it's okay by that standard. Unfortunately, when we went and measured it, and we did, we got not 1%, but 0.42% damping with a 22% coefficient of variation with ambient. And it went up a little bit with Frida K. So we'd like to do some Frida K testing on that one. And to do the testing, we rely on ambient vibration measurements. So this is one we've done before, tool building. It's not this one, actually. I just sort of showed this one because it's a nice tool building. Uh, we did some measurements on another one and we use this Bayesian technique. Uh, to estimate the damping with uncertain factors. This is actually quite a high number. And we use um, some special gadgets, which are distributed wire-free um, recorders, very precise, synchronized, to give you an idea what the building is looking like. So we do testing like that. Uh, we also do testing on tall timber buildings. So this is one that Alex Pavic did for his Euro project on Dino TTB. This is a, a timber building in Glasgow, of all places. And this is showing you the dynamic testing in progress. So if that video works for you, this is a speeded up version of the, of the kit that's used. So because it's quite a high frequency building, I think around about two to three Hertz, these APS shakers, which generate 450 odd newtons each can actually operate. So this is their optimal performance band so they can work and generate about a uh, thousand newtons of force, which is certainly enough to get the residents feeling it and feeling uncomfortable and to identify the vibration modes and to characterize the damping, which as it turns out is amplitude dependent. Um, we do have some shaker assemblers which we can use to get uh, higher mass and to operate down to much lower frequencies on tall, taller buildings but they can only go down to about 0.4, 0.5 Hertz. 
So it's not actually much use on the very, very tall buildings. So when it comes to very tall buildings, um, there are some exotic techniques out there. So one method that's been used in the past, so this is by uh, Roger Noon and Kenny Quark and Mates. You have a crane and you drop a load and you brake and you drop no brake. So this can in fact generate some significant impulsive forces, but because there's only so far you can drop the weight, you don't actually have many cycles of oscillation. And you can generate basically a single 1.5 kilonewton pulse sway pulse, which is enough to get you a decent level of amplitude. Um, NISA at UCLA have got some whirly shakers. So this one can generate one and a half kilonewtons. Uh, a reciprocating one can do 96 newtons. And this is at 0.167 hertz, which is about the sort of the frequency for something like a 70 story building or 70 to 100 uh, story, very tall building where you're very concerned about sort of wind and effects. Um, this is my sort of thing these days, generating forces by swaying. So if I do a little bit of a dance here, I can generate a force which is same as a shaker, but goes down to a lower frequency. So I'm much more portable than a shaker. I'm battery operated, highly portable, and provided I've got a metronome, I can uh, sway to a beat and I can synchronize myself to other people. So you can generate a decent amount of force. And this is something I've been trying recently in my back garden. Hilarious, maybe. So metronome, sort of sharp pulses, timed. And I can get about 130 newtons at 0.16 hertz, surprising. So that'll actually get a building going. Um, and if I have a bunch of us doing this, pulling on the columns, I have yet to try this. <laughs> But if I can get to do this, I reckon I can get the building shaking as well as that for sure, better than that. And with 10 of us, I can do that. And it's a whole lot cheaper. Okay. So I just pointed out that we don't really know about how and what an energy is distributed in buildings. There's a little research out there and it's showing that actually for very, very tall buildings, there's a certain amount much higher goes into the structural system, but it's still the floors are taking up a huge amount of the embodied energy. Okay, switching to floors now. Um, so it's a much clearer link between serviceability and embodied energy. So footfalls of source, remedial energies can be expensive and disruptive, passive damping only works in special cases. So if anyone knows two mass dampers controlling um, buildings, floors where vibrations are the order of about 0.01 millimeters, please let me know. I haven't found any. So typically the only solutions are structural modification, which means throwing material at it, which is terrible. Um, and it turns out that because of that approach, floor vibration serviceability tends to dominate uh, in uh, proper engineered floors. And you don't have a lot of margin there. So there's a lot of demand for high quality vibration environments supported by floors, obviously, biotech, electronics instruments, which we're finding low vibration requirements, a lot of demand for sustainable design with CLT floors, for example, um, and moving away from just throwing weight and stiffness. So this is the lean design approach. So now, as I said, we're moving from lowest cost to lowest carbon, big time. So how do we deal with this? Um, as F force dynamics, we're often called in to sort problems out, find out what's going wrong, and to improve the design process. So this is our basically our, our roadshow of shakers, amplifiers, cables, accelerometers, modal testing in this case. Um, I'm not sure what it was. It looks like a car park, but basically it's a floor. And from that, we get the usual um, frequency response functions, well-defined mode shapes. We can estimate quite reliably the modal masses for simulations. Um, and we can get the mode shapes nice and clear. And we very often find, by the way, the red dots are supposed to be columns. And you can see that the red dots are not actually zero, they're moving. So this is a very strange phenomenon where the whole of the building is bouncing vertically. Surprise, you never expected that, did you? So this is actually what happens in the real world with floors. You design NFEM, assume boundary conditions are fixed. No, wrong, not quite so, so easy. Uh, we can do great finite number models. 
we can use measure ground reaction forces. So here's me. That's a research project I had for a while in Sheffield, generating continuous ground reaction forces, huge variability in there. This is real world stuff as opposed to uh, plucking out the simple harmonic component, which is used in most of the design codes. We can propagate the walking force across FEMs like this one. And so this is going to be your force. This is modulated by the mode shape and outputs the response. And then you check that against the vibration service criteria. And obviously that's, but typically it's much less than that, but it's still a concern. And when you actually have the real structure to test, it's far, far better. So we're all good at FE modeling. Um, but there are errors involved, and it's only as good as the guy who put the model in, really. So there are all sorts of errors into FEM. So we still prefer to use the real deal. So if you're doing a simulation, we have the real measurements of uh, forces we can generate. We can go to a structure, we can measure the modal parameters, we can generate a modal model, and we can do scenario simulations based on that. So this is a theater uh, somewhere. I won't say where, but you can see it's got a very, very complex construction here. And if we can do a simulation based on that data, then we can work out how it will perform. Okay. So what about the assessment criteria? Um, so when it turns to the design, we talked to a lot of engineers through the iStruct T, and they said that uh, this problem is endemic, basically. They're all having problems dealing with it. So um, of this, the receiver, the person receiving it, the person sitting down in the office is by far the least researched part of the chain. There's all sorts of difficulties dealing with the criteria out there. And unfortunately, the criteria are suspect. The ones which we're using are actually based, surprisingly, not on measurements, but by simulations. So they do what they do. They have people in offices. They say, is this vibration you're experiencing acceptable or not? but they don't actually measure the vibrations. They've simulated it by final entertainment models, which is stunning, really. So we have a huge lack of data from the real world of what's actually happening out there. And the effect is this kind of stuff. So it may seem trivial, but apart from anything else, it's highly disruptive. So when you're talking about guys sitting in offices like this, and they're facing banks of screens like this in the dealing room, for example, I mean, it's really, really bad news because the floor is bouncing around and you can't concentrate and you're uncomfortable. Every time someone walks by, you're shaking. So in cases like this, uh, the consultants, the contractors, everyone gets sued. Um, no one else hears about it outside the business, but it's really bad news and it's compromising design and it needs to be dealt with. Um, so what we do, we deal with this thing called a response factor. Uh, R is equal to one. So um, we have this idea that a response and acceleration equal to 0 0.005 meter per second squared, RMS acceleration is equal to a number, a baseline called R is equal to one. So this is the ISO 10137 base curve of R is equal to one. And the design guidance says that for an operating theater, you need to stick to vibrations below that level. If you're in an office, ISO says, provided you're less than four, four times this, calculated from vibration measurements, frequency weighted, um, then you have uh, less than that, you're okay. They say that, and you should be okay. And then we have industry, I won't say which industry, saying you can relax the criteria to a response factor of eight, and you'll be okay. But guess what? you're not okay. So here we have, this is uh, our mates from Thornton Tomasetti, uh, formerly Swallow Acoustic, and they did some measurements on three buildings in uh, Canada, and notionally co-compliant, response factor less than four, um, generated complaints. We have a lot of problems with this, which we investigate with full scale dynamics and the fallout's huge. Uh, response factor of eight, even more complaints. So this is response factor of four, it's less than that measured, but it's failing. This is what it looks like. So this is the sort of response you're getting here. So this is getting you response factor 
less than four, that's corresponding to that level of movement. And what are we talking about? Displacements of 20 microns. The whole of the floor design is being governed by 20 microns of displacement. And this propagates to 50% of the embodied carbon in all new engineered office buildings. It's crazy, it really is. And there needs to be ways to deal with this. And guess what, there are. So we looked at the effect of reducing the slab depth on the impact of embodied energy and uh, response factor. And as you expect, if you start from a 210 meter millimeter slab and you reduce the amount of uh, the slab depth, you'll find that your response factor will increase. So this is for 170. So you're picking up in this area a response factor of four, that's unacceptable. And as you decrease your slab depth even more to 130, it's just leaner, you're saving carbon, you're saving cost, but it's becoming unacceptable. So therefore you find that a bigger area of the floor is now becoming unacceptable. So it's not good. So what do you do about it? Right, so this is where we come in. So this is the last two parts of the talk, um, dealing with the mitigation strategies and investigating the human factors and the uh, thresholds. So this is something that we've been working on for, I would say a decade or so uh, in Exeter. So this is uh, active mass damping for active vibration control. Um, so the various strategies out there for dealing with the problem, as I said, is you can do a retrofit if it's an existing building, or we can improve the design in a new building. And if it doesn't work, you just throw more material at it. You can look at passive control, try it. Viscous dampers work in some situations, provided you can engage your own motion sufficiently. Two mass dampers may work, but I've yet to see evidence that they work at the level of about 10 microns, and there is constrained layer damping as well. So we reckon that active vibration control is a way forward because it will directly counteract very efficiently the force you put on by destructive interference. It works the same way as your headphones. So this is the prototype, which we had about eight years ago. It fits in the depth of a slab. It displaces 75 millimeters. It generates a couple of kilonewtons, um, which is way more than the first time on a pedestrian. Um, and it's quite compact and low cost. So this is a thing in action. So this is a prototype. So you recognize this guy. And this is the other guy. So this is the active mass damper. And you can see the mass moving up and down. So he's walking at two hertz because the floor frequency is four hertz. And the experience of whoever's sitting on the floor, we tried it. And it's a very lively floor before. That's the one with the flapping monitors. Um, and it's quite lively before, but when the active mass stamper was turned on, you would compare it with Lenin's mausoleum. It's dead calm. You can't feel a thing. So it's actually reduced the response factor from a, a pretty big number to something which is way within the criteria. It's a very, very impressive performance. So this is a walking path backwards and forwards. So it works. It's amazing. So this is a direct plug and uh, an advertisement for our, our new product. So we've sort of moved forward to, I would call it a beta prototype, um, which we will start to ship soon. So this is now uh, putting together all the ideas and the principles which we've learned into one box, which we can install on floors to fix vibrations existing, or which can be built in at the design level to avoid having to throw material at it. So uh, as I said, very good at reducing vibrations, low mass, you can build long spans, so you're not constrained to go to short spans anymore. Um, it's actually low energy consumption. The operational energy is pretty low, compact. Um, and our mates in Thorns and Tomasetti are promoting it actively for us, which is very nice of them. So there's a lot of applications potentially for this device to control vibrations in existing and new builds. Um, and it works far better than TMDs. So there's a little thing here, which I, I, I won't bore you with, but effectively, this is to show that if you don't have uh, control, you have huge response factors around. You try with TMDs, lots of TMDs. You can only get so far, even assuming they actually work at low displacements. And then if you put the active mass dampers, you're getting it nice and low, pretty much efficiently. 
much, much better solutions. And this is a very, very big floor. So this is about 60 meters by 60 meters. Okay. So the last part. So this is the VSIM facility. So this is my baby, if you like. So this is the one which I led the proposal on. So um, we've got involvement from the University of Bath. They have a sister facility, which deals with tall building sway. Uh, we deal with largely full vibration and also motion in uh, lots of high rise buildings in sway. Colleague from University of Exeter is also involved. Um, so this is it. So this is our new seven million pound facility. Very nice building. We occupy, occupy a little part of this one over here. That's what the platform looks like. It's a 3.6 meter square. It's got a huge force plate array on it. Probably the biggest you'll find anywhere. Uh, nine HTC Vive Pro VR headsets uh, and a motion capture on track array. And we can take a ton payload. So that's a lot of people actually. Uh, although not at the moment, I had to say. Um, we have nine headsets, but this was before COVID. Um, and it does six axis motion simulation with an octopod. So this is unique. Actually, I think you won't find many of these elsewhere. So this was designed by a company which builds A380 flight simulators, or at least it did. I guess that market's gone bust now. And this is in the headquarters in Amsterdam, just to show you what it does. And it's not designed to be large amplitude. This is designed to be very well controlled precision at low amplitude, because this is the levels we're talking about, 20 microns. So it goes sway, it goes vertically, and it also does the roll and pitch in the yaw. And it's controlled by uh, six stepper motors, so eight stepper motors, controlled by flexible links to the motion platform. So this is about three tons, with the first um, mode uh, of vibration is about 60 hertz. So this is a way above. So this is the performance envelope going from 0.5 to 40 hertz. We can get up to about, four meter per second squared if you want to, but the limit is normally two meter per second squared by the, the stroke. So this is the performance envelope which we're hitting as required. Um, so what do we use it for? We're using it for, or intending to use it in the design process. So this is something which is coming up. So we have a project dealing with schools, um, fast build schools, where we have um, example of 360 video and this is not the vibration from the school of Hastings to add. I can't show that, but this is an example which we have recorded elsewhere. And we put this through vSIM, and this is me sitting there trying to do some work and experiencing this and complaining. So I would go and sit in the building which has been maybe redesigned, a different building, different criteria, and decide if it's acceptable or not by sitting there and judging it. And we're designing experimental protocols with the help from uh, psychologists in Bath to work out the best way to work it out and how to do it with cohorts of dozens of people sitting in the building. And this is some I've done before. So this is one I've done recently. Um, this is Stanis Ivanovich's uh, fiber reinforced morbidly bridge outside VSIM. So this is me walking at a half the natural frequency, trying to get the bridge going. You can't see it actually. And I've taken the recordings, I've put some inertial measurement units on the bridge to measure it, and I've replayed it in VSIM. So this is me standing on a treadmill and start to shake the ground. Ooh, so this is actually the motion of the bridge. And I'm struggling to stay on the treadmill um, because it's moving so much. If I had a wider treadmill, it wouldn't be so much of a big deal, but it's actually a little bit disconcerting. And we're also doing some research on human structure interaction. So this is uh, Seagong uh, with a body latex suit with motion capture markers for the Optrack system. So we're looking at human structure interaction to see how the, the forces generated uh, are changed by the motion of the platform. The standards research. And this is a snapshot of some research for Parkinson's disease. So this is uh, Will Young, who's doing research on this. And this is a signal which we put in the design delivery for him. Watch that. So basically this is a large acceleration pulse, sort of put people off their step and to see how well you adapt to that. And the last slide. So this is the Bath facility, uh, which is our sister facility. 
which is operating in a different way. It's a hydraulic biaxial motion platform, which goes down to 0 0.05 hertz uh, and up to about half a hertz or more. So this is complementary to the Exeter facility. Um, it generates, well, up to 60 milli G, and it's got a 400 mil stroke, which is going to cover most of the bases for tool building design. And it's, it's using not a HMD, um, but a kind of a cave computer assisted virtual environment, uh, projected virtual reality. And if you wear 3D um, specs, you get a very, very powerful effect of the environment you're in. And this has already been used um, for studying tool building motion. Okay, so I'm gonna end with some takeaways and I will be very, very interested to hear your thoughts actually. So I've sort of thrown a few things out there um, which many of you might be aware of and some uh, questions which you can answer me. Um, there's huge pressure out there to reduce embodied energy. Um, sustainable materials, so far they're not terribly well understood and they can be problematic. And strength of their design, as you know, overlooks vibration serviceability. So people who design things that don't fall down come a cropper when it comes to vibration problems. And it tends to be that the vibration service will be the government design very often. Um, in tool building, it's sway, and for floors, it's vertical vibration. We need to understand and rationalize this source path receiver uh, chain much better and reduce the uncertainties. Um, again, the plug, active mass damping is a powerful solution with active vertical control, vertical vibration control. If you're dealing with long spans and already problematic floors, and uh, vSIM can help you to uh, design structures efficiently in real world simulated conditions. And we reckon that we can revamp all of vibration criteria um, for in the current design guidance. So that, that's our aim to do that. Okay, so if you have questions and suggestions, I'd be very pleased to hear. Thank you very much, James. Uh, we took a bit longer, but I think it's interesting Sorry. for everyone to see the facility. So I, I really think it was uh, worth uh, uh, the extra time. Uh, maybe a question from my side to begin with. Uh, you show, you know, this concept of this virtual simulator, let's say, which I think uh, is very interesting in that it takes uh, motion uh, into, into account. Up to now, when you hear about augmented or virtual realities, it's usually through goggles and what you get as a sensation through vision. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you've mentioned in your presentation also the importance of sound, possibly yes. also the import importance of uh, sight. Uh, is this something you will bring together uh, or as well in, in one experiment, let's say, somehow on the... Facility? Well, yeah, so, I mean, th this is a bath one. So uh, if you look here, I mean, the idea for the bath one, they have a, it's a climate controlled chamber. And mm -hmm. we found, I mean, we talked to other folk doing this, the lightning condition has a big effect on your experience. So it's not just, you know, the vibration, but it's also the environmental factors which have a very big influence. Mm -hmm. So we, we're gonna run some studies with a large cohort. I mean, you've got a very sort of big parameter space, effectively all these variables which impinge on it. So you need to find a good way to do that, um, to put the parameters through, but you would want to consider um, the lighting conditions, the heat, uh, the humidity, um, what you're looking at, as well as the motion. And you have sensors, which your body worn sensors, sort of EMGs and the like, to detect your, 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 your responses. So, um, this is something which we're going to be looking at to um, we're putting together a project, uh, collaborating with Bath to explore this and to find out, you know, get into the depth of the, how these criteria work for tall buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe let me remind everyone for questions that you can actually send them through the chat uh, and you can also do it uh, in the common chat if you wish. You have to read them out though, Eleni, because I'm not with you. Yeah, 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 exactly. That would be my role. I have one question, Eleni. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, James, a very interesting presentation. So uh, it, it, it helps to switch in a little bit uh, our mind, no? Because f till now I just used to see uh, buildings, structures in the checking table, and now I can see people in, yeah. the, in, this, in this facility. So it's yeah. clear that you are changing the point of view of the designer from the structural, from the resistance of the building to the human comfort of the, of mm. the people. Yeah. And for sure that, as you mentioned, in, in many cases, probably the, the vibration uh, of the floors is the, 
is the dominating uh, a scenario. But I'm wondering if this is always the case. For instance, um, if if the the material or the thickness of the of the floor is not more controlled by, for instance, if the possibility of seismic actions or other types of extreme actions. Well, yes. Yeah, so I mean, the the floor. I mean, the, the, I I've little experience in seismic. Um, you know better than I how that's controlled probably. But so we are not concerned with seismic performance here. So the, the vertical performance, I mean, if you have a sort of vertical vibration of a building, um, you know, you're going to be upset anyway. And it may not, you know, you have your own a seismic design for that. But it turns out that, you know, most of the time you're not designing for that. The people we talk to, that's not their design constraints. Yeah, because I find them, sorry. No, because sometimes the seismic action, the seismic action can control the thickness yeah. of your of your floor, no, and this, do, could, yes, yes. and this could be governing the the, the whole process of the design. Well, yes, it, it does. I mean, it, it's it's not true that it always governs design the vibration, but you know, out of all the huge sort of build area coming up, uh, it, it, you know, we've done a little bit of market research and we found that it's just a pretty big proportion. Is going to be this, this governed by this, this um, floor serviceability due to humans. I mean, it's not everything by all means, but the, the, you know, out of the 230 odd billion square meters, you know, even a few percent of that is is a massive concern um, for the people who use it. So yeah, it's it certainly remains a concern. It's not it's not everywhere, but in the UK at least, the structural engineers we talk to, they reckon it's their concern. But I, I mentioned in parts of in Europe, North America. It won't be probably in Japan and, and parts of you know South America where it's a big concern, and where they have different criteria and where they're designing largely in concrete, which are fairly stiff structures and, and well built differently. It's true. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can ask a question from uh, the audience. This is from Christos Baltas and uh, asks what percentage of the general generalized mass of the floor do we need typically for the mass uh, of the active dampers? In order to reduce vibration, is it a factor of ten? No, it's it's not the it's not the, the generalized mass. It, it's you know the, the point is that if you have a person who's walking around, um, they generate uh, a, a harmonic force or an oscillating force, which is the order of about half a kilonewton, depending on what you're doing. So you only have to control that. Mm. You don't have to control, you know, put big forces there to control the resonance of the floor. All you need to do is cancel out the forces from the human. And it turns out those are not so big and those are well controllable. Maybe to add on this, uh, I understand they're probably not so big, but is it an issue that they are distributed through the floor in patterns that are not very easily regulated? Yeah, so I mean- assume it, a main path of motion and- uh... Yeah, so that, that becomes challenging. So if you have a floor which is nice and, and you know very, very simple, like a, a rectangular you know, simple supported mm -hmm. grid, then you have a first mode, which is a certain frequency. Then you have a sequence of second modes. And the first mode is one you control, which is the lowest frequency. So you know exactly where to put your damper. But when you get to more complex structures, it's becoming a, an optimizing process uh, involving simulations, which may be based on finite element models or modal models to work mm -hmm. out the placements for the dampers to control the various modes. So you have localized modes global modes mm. and those local modes will have their own performance and their own generalized mass and you will have to work out the optimal location to put a damper to control that but it's different from a tear mass damper because a tear mass damper only controls one mode whereas an active mass damper will control any mode that occurs with a large amplitude mm. the floor where it exists and it can also track and change and optimize whereas a tear mass damper can't you're stuck with it and, and you don't consider it an issue, you know, some of the known uh, drawbacks for active uh, vibration mitigation has to do with the power consumption, the need for... Yeah, so... But maybe in these situations, likely it's not an issue because we're not facing extremes of... The precisely. Yeah. Nobody's going to die if the power fails. I mean, that's the concern for seismic, obviously. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be reliant on, on energy to control safety. So this is only a serviceability issue. So if you lose power, then people become uncomfortable. That's the worst case. Or if you have controlling a, a, a lab, then you may lose a bit of product or your, 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 um, your experiments fail or something. But you just reset the power and you're okay. And in terms of the energy consumption, 
we've done the numbers and we work out that over 30 years of life of one of these things that we're talking about, uh, a ton of CO2, which can often be uh, supplied by renewable sources as well. So it's a very, very low component. It's not negligible, but it's pretty small and needs to be factored in. Mm -hmm. Eleni, I have here a question from the audience. It's actually Yves Roland. It says, uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. Uh, one question. In many applications, it seemed that there was a single person walking. What about setups with chaotic walking patterns or multiple people, possibly walking at different speeds with different names? Yes, that, so we've done a research project on that actually. So one of uh, Alex Pavich's students has researched that to, to see how that works. So we actually put uh, motion sensors and tracking into to buildings to work out the, the paths, where they go, and the numbers of people to do that. So yes, I mean, the single person is the design criterion, the single bad man at the worst possible frequency. But as with footbridges, you know, that's not the real world. I mean, we don't have the same challenges as footbridges with crowds, um, but we do have maybe one or two people moving around. So yes, it's not so simple. Um, we have published some papers on that um, and that is moving on. So yes, that, that needs to be addressed. Um, there isn't guidance out there on that yet. I have to say it's still single person. But that, 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 that's, that's, a, that's a very valid point. For me, it also seem, seems uh, challenging to input the motion so that you're moving, uh, let's say, a person walking on a footbridge, for example, mm -hmm. because as you have a static uh, uh, treadmill, uh, you sort of have to feed the motion that comes in different points of the bridge, for example, of the footbridge. Is this uh, difficult? Oh, so how do you mean, Eleni? I don't quite get that. Can you explain again? Well, because uh, you typically have, um, let's say, a static treadmill, right? And then you have to move the actuator so that it mimics the path that the person meets from the motion of a bridge, if it's a pedestrian bridge, for example. Well, we can do that. I mean, we're actually just starting to do that. So that, that's, mm -hmm. that's a simple treadmill there. That's mm -hmm. not actually an instrumented one. But uh, from that, the load cells or force plates can, can actually measure that force that goes through that but we're ending up having some better treadmill, which is wide enough so mm. that we can put people in the virtual reality. On that narrow treadmill, you can't do it because mm. you, know, you can see that I, I couldn't stay just, you know, even with good eyesight. But if you have someone in a virtual reality headset, they can't see their physical surroundings. They can see their virtual surroundings. You have to be wide enough so they're not constrained. Mm. Then you can work out, you can put them anywhere you like, and you can adjust the motion of the platform to emulate the mode shapes as you move across the bridge and mm. um, the motions are coming in. So you could, whatever you, whatever you can measure, you can put in basically. But yes, that's doable for sure. Uh, maybe another aspect uh, that uh, basically would complement well this framework is uh, what you mentioned that um, you need to also have appropriate processing tools uh, from the measurement side just to, mm. You know, interpret what is the dumping that is associated with the system, how this translates uh, eventually into, uh, into properties of, of the system. Would this be a task that you also try to um, attach processing algorithms or modules to the simulators? Is this an add-on? Uh, yeah, so the, 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 this ecosystem, if you like, of the simulator is quite complex. I mean, we have the way we operate it, we have a very complex machine. I would say it's like a vintage Ferrari. You know, it needs someone who understands how to Right, so the hardware is there, obviously, and highly flexible, but I'm wondering if, yeah, you can add on to this. So then um, where it comes in, we have folk like myself who understand, you know, the dynamics and the, the processing. So in fact, you, you nailed it there because getting the signal, the drive signal for motion simulators has always been a challenge. I started out doing this in my PhD in Bristol on the earthquake simulator. Mm. How to get the signal in, which is the correct one, and reproduce it faithfully on a platform. So you would have a transfer function, which is relatively benign on this one, but there is a little bit of a resonant, a flat resonance curve, which you have to take account of and manage. You have to take, how do you measure? So on that footbridge I showed, I had to work out a way to measure the rotation reliably um, so I could put it into the platform. So I took um, the inertial measurement units, a pair of them to measure acceleration on both sides. And also because I have gyros, which I can integrate, mm -hmm. I could recover within reason the rotation in the other axis. So I could get basically five degrees of freedom out of a couple of IMUs and mm -hmm. play them back in the V-SIM. So I, I, I have a pretty good control 
over the motion. But it's not straightforward. It's, it, takes a bit, it takes a bit of doing to get it there, actually. So that all these simulations, all these forces, the signals I'm getting, you know, uh, someone's boat, um, a push bike, a train, a footbridge, you name it, it's all sort of coming and we've been challenged to sort of put through, even a bridge on a, a, an aircraft carrier, for example, mm -hmm. military simulations, battlefield simulations, people trying to shoot guns and do stuff like that, military involved in this, doing surgical operations in field conditions, maybe in helicopters or planes, you know, this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Reproducing the signals, the motion signals, it's a challenge. But provided you can measure that, and we're good at doing this, we can translate that, you know, and maybe we have to sort of soften it and um, filter it and scale it a bit. And with the power of the VR, you can make it enhance it, actually, because if you tried VR, you know, you can think you're moving when you're not. And you can enhance, this, you can enhance the experience very, very powerfully with VR. Let me give the floor to John for a question since we're nearing the end of the session. If you have a close. Well, if, uh, James, if you allow me, probably a more personal question. Yeah. Uh, from my side, you know that my, my background is more in bridge engineering. Yeah. And I know also that you have a, an enormous experience of background on testing uh, longer span bridges, suspension bridges, any kind of bridges for ambient vibration and so on. But today you didn't present anything about bridges. So I'm a little no. bit worried about uh, the question is, is there, is there is a future on bridges or not, James? Well, yeah, so I, I, I have to be honest, I, I'm getting old and there are lots of very young, <laughs> very, very sophisticated, very clever people out there. I can't compete, um, but I am still engaged and, and the area which I thank, thanks for asking the question, by the way, because I, I, I'm becoming very interested in the way that this um, sort of human performance crosses over into you know, big structures. We're talking about motion capture, actually. So we're talking about motion tracking by optical means, motion tracking by inertial measurement units. And these are exactly the tools which we need to use on full scale structures. So increasingly I've had some students, there are many sort of from China, CSC students um, who come and visit playing with optical motion capture and going out and measuring civil structures, long span, short span, bridges, towers, you know, telecoms towers, and tracking the performance with cameras, you know, uh, consumer grade cameras, and getting very, very good data out of them. So now it becomes, you know, conceivable that we will have sort of full field motion capture structures recovering. And it's already happening. You can see MIT are doing it, Cambridge are doing it, a whole bunch of people are doing this. And it's becoming a big deal now. So in the future, you don't need to go and put accelerometers on the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> My life will be easy. <laughs> Thanks, James, for your answer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then, James, maybe uh, since we're a bit over our time, I want to give the floor to you for a closing statement. So what would you like to leave us with? What do you well, think could change maybe with this uh, sort of methods and tools? Well, I would, I would say that, I mean, I, I become a sort of convert to this sort of lean design and, and this uh, modern energy part relatively recently. And, you know, I, I, it's, it's, it's a serious, serious business, actually. And it's suddenly increasing. You know, it's going to hit us. You can hear it more and more. And all engineers are going to have to face this problem of, of managing design, the structures, um, you know, to reduce embodied energy. And, and it's just great that, to me that vibration is such a big deal in this and that we have the right tools to tackle it. It's marvellous. So I hope that vibration serviceability and human factors will become a, a very, very big concern. And we're, we're very interested to hear from anyone who wants to work with us. We need research engagement to sustain this facility because it's, it's a feed the machine situation. It needs people, it needs money to keep it running. And for that, we need research projects. Um, so we need people to come and talk to us. And we're very interested to hear from you. And it's always great fun, actually. Everything I do on this machine, it's hilarious. It really is. It's the best thing <laughs> I've ever done. It looks <laughs> like fun it's so bridges. So maybe we'll take you up on the invitation. Please do. Yeah. Come and play. Great. So right. on that note, I want to thank you very much for uh, offering this talk. I want to thank the audience who joined and Joan for co-hosting. And you will actually find a recording of this uh, talk uh, uploaded on the website for those of you who uh, would like to disseminate it as well. Okay. Thank you all. This was our last uh, part or last session for this uh, uh, semester. And we will pick up again in the fall. Until then, uh, I wish everyone a 
a good summer. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.